Oh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, please be seated. This past Wednesday, a few of us gathered here in person and a few more over Zoom, and we did our annual Ash Wednesday service, which is a strange gathering where we come and we are reminded that someday we are going to die. And uh, this, because of the tenor of Lent and it's a Wednesday night, I decided we're going to do what they call a contemplative Eucharist. And so uh, Ben had the evening off. I'm sure he was working at his other jobs and very busy. But we didn't have any music Wednesday night for the service. And afterwards, some people commented about how it was actually really interesting because it accentuated or brought out things that they hadn't noticed. Or, you know, you say these words for decades and decades and decades, but then all of a sudden you take something away like the music and certain things just get elevated. And there is a way in which our music, as beautiful as it is, can maybe sometimes be a distraction. Or there are times when we have the Jazz Mass, which we skipped this month because we're in Lent, uh, where just the, the tenor and the attitude and the energy kind of accentuates other things in the service. But how do we avoid uh, distractions in our lives? You know, we experience this thing in a new way, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you take something away and it, it gets more vibrant. I, I had the same experience. I love baseball, and when I go to games, which I love, I'll find that there's so much going on. I'm like people watching. I'm trying to notice this, trying to notice that, and then all of a sudden, it's the sixth inning. The score's five to two, and I have no idea who scored when or what happened, right? It's just like, what, what's going on? You know, but I love being there, but I'm like enjoying the hot dog too much. And whereas when I'm at home, I can be a little more focused on the actual game, right? Uh, and so we have that in our lives where we allow ourselves to be distracted. And I once heard, it might be an apocryphal tale, but a businessman was able to meet with uh, Warren Buffett, the famed investor at one point, like the second wealthiest human on the planet, very successful according to all the metrics of the earth. And this businessman got to meet with him, and Warren Buffett said, what are the things you want to get done in the next year? And the man wrote out a list of like 15 items. And Warren Buffett said, all right, what are the top three that you have? And he thought a lot, and he circled the top three. And Warren Buffett said, all right, now ignore all the other ones and only focus on these three. And he was like, but some of these are important. He said, you'll never do it well and you'll never get to it. It's only going to be a distraction. Focus on these three things. And we live in a time where we're never more easily uh, distracted. We have so much distraction available to us everywhere that it, it can just be overwhelming. And you can go an entire day not really getting anything done, but just being distracted. And I uh, heard a tale of a man who was, was an author, and he was successful and had written a couple books. But his, his final, the most recent book, the deadline was coming. His publisher was getting really mad at him. And he said, you got to write this book. And he was like, all right, how can I focus and eliminate distractions? And he realized there was one place where he was always very focused. And so he bought a round-trip plane ticket from New York to Tokyo because he found airplanes made him focus. And so he flew 15 hours straight to Tokyo, riding the whole time, and then he got to Tokyo, was there for an hour or two, got on the plane and just flew back and spent 30 <laughs> hours on the plane, but he got his book done, finished, and was just able to focus. And so I wonder, what can we do in our lives during this Lenten period to minimize those distractions and to stay focused. Because uh, we read today about Jesus going into the desert to fast and pray, and then uh, he's tempted. And what if we were to view in our lives temptation 
as those things which we allow to distract us from who we want to be or what we want to do, right? It's a willfulness, right? So you have your goal, say, you know, I want to get to be this level, a vice president or something at this corporation. Sometimes that doesn't happen for exterior for forces, right? Like, oftentimes if you're a woman or if you're black or all those things, that's not temptation. That's just, you know, structural marginalization and oppression. But temptation is things we have control over that we allow to distract us from becoming who we want to be. It's that distraction that gets in the way. And uh, so this Lenten period is great because we have the opportunity to re-examine our own practices and habits and how we're living and see if it's, it's accomplishing and serving our goal. And I would assume for us as Christians, one of our main goals is to draw closer to the beloved community of God. And so if you allow yourself to just be distracted nonstop, you're also being distracted from that communion with God, that connection, that, that uh, you know, connection to that beloved community gets harder and harder because you're allowing yourself to be distracted. And so Lent is a time where we look at what are we doing that's not making that connection harder and harder. Now, God always loves you. You don't have to do anything for God to love you or for you to be part of the beloved community. And there are certain practices we can do that can make it more uh, easy to believe and know that God loves us. Right? So you don't have to do anything, and yet we can do things that make it easier for us to know that God's. It's like God is always there, but sometimes that it doesn't feel like it as much. And I think in Lent, we can look at what are the spiritual practices we want to engage in that makes it easier to feel that and feel that connection. And so uh, I once heard someone say that a lot of Episcopal sermons are just interesting reflections on something, and they don't actually ask us to do anything. And so Lent is fun because I, as the Episcopal priest, get to ask you to do things. You get homework uh, during Lent. <laughs> so what are some spiritual practices you can engage in? Because uh, some speak to and work for uh, uh, some people, and they don't work for others, and others need this, others need that. So in today's passage, Jesus fasts and prays, goes into the desert and fasts and prays. And so maybe fasting once a week would be a spiritual discipline for you. Maybe you fast instead of an entire day, you skip breakfast and lunch and spend that time praying, and then you eat dinner. I'll just confess, I'm not good at fasting. It, whenever I've tried to fast and pray, my prayers are all about how uh, thankful I am and how amazing like uh, hot fudge Sundays are. I just start praying all about different foods that I really, really, really want to eat while I'm fasting, and so for me, uh, it's, it's a more challenging spiritual discipline. So I'm, I'm just not good at that, but I have friends, I know people who have gotten a lot out of that. Another spiritual discipline may be reading scripture more regularly. I've, I've said before that there are often 31 days in a month or less, and there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. So you can get up and, oh, I'll read a chapter in the book of Proverbs, or Say you want to read all the psalms, so every morning you wake up and you read a psalm. Most of the time that will be done in three or four minutes. Uh, psalm 119 is really long, so that one will take you a while. But you start it uh, now, and in a year you'll have gone through the psalms two times, right, having read them. Or maybe you want to meditate on Scripture, and so you just want to read, like, one of the Gospels, or even maybe just like some of the more famous passages. <clears throat> so like you read Matthew chapters 5 and 6, the famous Sermon on the Mount. And every day you read that and you just meditate on that. Another spiritual practice that, that works really well for me is journaling. And I have to do it with a pen and paper and write it out. Because if I'm on the computer, I'll get an email 
I'll be like, oh, uh, how are the Cubs going to do this year? And I'll look that up. And I'm just too, it's too tempting when I use a computer to not stay focused. And so I enjoy writing out and journal. And when, when I journal, I'll, I'll write out what I've been doing, what I've been thinking. And inevitably, it'll end up, I'll be writing out prayers, right? And I'll be asking God for this or that or praying for this person or that person. But the key is to not be distracted, right? Like I gotta focus and studies have shown if you have a pen and paper, old fashioned, then that's the best way to stay focused. That's how I have an old legal pad. So that's I make notes for my sermon and stuff. That's how I do it. Uh, or another thing, if you don't necessarily want to journal, say you want to be a person of prayer. But you wake up in the morning, you're like, I want to pray. But then you just turn, you're like, I also want to know what's going on in the world. So you turn on the news, and then you find all day you've had the news just droning in the background. And you've allowed yourself to be distracted. So maybe if you love watching the news, an option, again, this is homework for you, maybe set like a 30-minute timer and turn the news on, and maybe have a pen and paper nearby while you watch the news. You write down things and people you can pray for. And then after 30 minutes, you turn the news off, and now you have a list, because there's a lot of awful things going on in the world. There's plenty of things to pray for. And oftentimes we watch the news, and it's just horrible, and we don't know what we can do, right? Like Russia is at war with Ukraine. I don't understand why, and I don't know what I can do about it. But I know that I can be a person of prayer and a person who prays for peace and wisdom and world leaders and somehow an end to this violence and killing of civilians. So that's an option. You can journal, you can watch the news and like write down things to pray for, right? Now whatever discipline you choose to adopt in this Lenten season, there's also a key here for you to be more successful. And at the end of these 40 days, Jesus spends 40 days uh, fasting and praying. By the way, that's like a, a connection back to Moses when Moses spent 40 days up on the mountain communing with God. And remember a week ago, I think I preached on uh, Moses' face was shining and glowing and all that. This is a direct connection. Moses was 40 days on the mountain. Jesus was 40 days in the desert, and then this Lenten period is actually 40 days long. Now we also uh, have feast days, so it's actually 46 days long, because all the Sundays during Lent are actually feast days. So if for Lent, say you give up eating meat, on Sundays you can eat meat, because it's a feast day. Uh, you don't have to, though, you can also just stick with whatever your discipline is the whole season, or Sundays are a feast day, and you can celebrate and do what you want. <laughs> but one way to be successful is at the end of these 40 days, Jesus is tempted, and, then, and, and it says Jesus is famished and hungry and alone. And after the temptation, Jesus succeeds, doesn't succumb to the temptation. And it's good to be reminded that Jesus experienced temptation, so knows what we go through when we are tempted to be distracted and do this and that. Jesus doesn't succumb to temptation, and then the angels come and care for Jesus. And what I see in my life is that angels are my friends, my family, my community, and the people around me. And one thing you, you learn is uh, you don't have to do all of this alone. We have people walking this walk beside us. We have church members. You can call me if you need some, some help doing your discipline. And uh, studies have actually shown that this is effective. So if you want to, say, take on exercising, three days a week you want to go run, if you try it on your, bet, your best without telling anyone and just with gumption and what people say is white knuckle, uh, you're like 24% likely to succeed and make it long lasting. If you just tell another person what your plan is, if you call a friend and just tell them, you're like 65% or whatever the number is, more likely to succeed. Just telling someone and including someone in that 
Now you have someone else knows and it's like, oh man, they might ask me if I've been going running when I call them. So it's a form of accountability, but you can also have that person might support you and encourage and be your, your uh, cheerleader. Now, if you convince your friend to run with you three times a week and you both commit to doing it together, then it's, you're like 92% uh, successful or 92% of the time people succeed in making this a long lasting discipline. And so as we enter this Lenten period, as we do our best to engage in spiritual practices so that we can focus and be directed on the people we need to be, we also know that we're not doing it alone. We have the angels around us in our midst, our, our fellow uh, congregants, our loved ones, our family, and our friends. And if uh, you know all that fails, give me a call. <laughs> I'll be there to hopefully with grace and kindness encourage you and support you in however you need to uh, pursue your spiritual disciplines during this beautiful period of Lent. Amen.